Good evening and welcome from New Canaan Library. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services and Programming, and I hope you are all doing well. We have a great program for you this evening. Well, tonight, Tracy Panic is with us. Tracy is a historian for Levi Strauss and Co. She manages the day-to-day -day workings of the Levi Strauss and Co. archives. She is a regular contributor to Unzip, the company's blog. Tracy is also the media spokesperson for Levi Strauss and Co. Heritage. Tonight, she will give us a virtual tour and discuss highlights from the exhi exhibition, Levi Strauss, A History of American Style, which was exhibited at the Contemporary Jewish Museum last year. Tracy, we're so happy to have you with us this evening. Thank you. I am excited to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Anthony. And hello, everyone. I bring you greetings from the San Francisco Bay Area, where I live and work. And I'm delighted tonight to uh, share my uh, my presentation, Levi Strauss, A History of American Style. Uh, this was an exhibition that we opened uh, in February 2020 at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. And uh, it was a terrific opening. We had lots of people, including descendants of Levi himself. If you look at the center of this photo, you can see uh, Levi's great, great grand nephew with the leather jacket on and uh, a former CEO of the company. We had other family members and visitors at the opening uh, looking at material that were on that was on display, as well as people uh, gathered in the hall here in the uh, the entrance to the exhibition. And few of us at that time in February 2020 had any inkling that a month later, the COVID pandemic would shut down the exhibition. And we quickly shifted to virtual presentations and other ways to engage the community after spending uh, all the time that we did putting the exhibition together. Uh, the show, by the way, was opened, uh, reopened for a brief period in 2020, near the end of 2020, um, closed again and then reopened last April and stayed open through, um, through August. But uh, putting together and actually the undertaking to put together and capture the story of the man and the now 169 year old iconic company that he founded uh, and the impact that his company and products have made on fashion, culture, uh, business, and American identity uh, took quite a while. Uh, and in many ways, you could compare it to a rather well-worn pair of Levi's, which would be very appropriate. Uh, these Levi's, in fact, uh, which arrived about a month and a half before the show began, uh, giving me a lot of heartburn in, uh, in the process. They came from the far north, from Yukon Territory in Canada. And uh, they were, they date to the early 1900s and were worn by a miner during the Klondike era. We call them the Klondike 201 jeans. And when they arrived uh, in our archives before the exhibition started, uh, they were tattered, they were covered with, with tears and holes, and there was even a, a, a huge rip in the bottom of one of the legs from the bulldozer that had unearthed this pair that had been under mud for decades. And I spent a lot of time piecing back together the, the genes uh, and spending time uh, doing what I could to preserve them. And uh, even though there were still missing bits of denim and holes in them, the, uh, the pants, once we did this preservation, uh, tell a remarkable story of endurance, as is the story of Levi Strauss and company. Uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, the, um, the work that Alf and Marlene Roberts here, who you can see on screen, um, the work that they did unearthing those, uh, those Levi's, the Klondike 201s, um, could be compared to the process that we went through uh, digging around for artifacts, mainly from our company archives, to put the exhibition together. Uh, as you could see in this photo, uh, Alf and Marlene uh, working on their placer claim with that bulldozer there on the right, 
uh, it took them a while to to unearth those Levi's. And in the process, they also unearthed other treasures you can see from the mammoth tusks to those dinosaur bones. And that same process of digging around is, is exactly what we did in putting together this exhibition. Uh, we had over 250 artifacts on display for the show, the majority of them coming from the company archives, which is housed in San Francisco. And I'm, along with being the historian, I'm the director of our archives. Uh, telling the story and being able to share the story of Levi Strauss uh, was exciting to do in the exhibition, um, especially because not much is known and not, met, not much remains of Levi the man. Here he is uh, in his younger years. Uh, Levi was an immigrant to America. He came from Bavaria, Germany. He was the youngest son in a Jewish family and arrived first in New York. He had a couple of brothers who had come over years earlier and they had a dry goods wholesale business and Levi learned the ropes of the business from them until he heard about something going on in the West Coast. It was uh, the gold rush and he decided to expand the family's business uh, in California, uh, but he did it under his own name. Uh, and uh, in the location, uh, not far from where we are located today. This is Battery Street in San Francisco, and uh, our headquarters are, are located on Battery Street today, but uh, further, further uh, north in the city. Uh, not much, as I mentioned, is left of Levi, but we were delighted to be able to display a, uh, a rare letter that Levi himself penned in 1891. And in the letter, uh, it's December 28th, it's near the end of the year, Levi's writing to one of his customers and he, he wishes her a happy new year. And uh, he thanks her for a case of wine that she has sent him for the holidays. And he replies, although I am no wine expert, my judgment is that California need not feel ashamed of what you are producing. So who was this customer that Levi was responding, corresponding with? Her name was Mrs. Poppy. And there she is in the center uh, of that photo there. She owned a dry goods store in Sonoma, which is uh, in the heart of Napa country. This was in the years of the early Napa winery uh, industry as it was just getting underway. And we get to see through the Levi's lens a lot of history uh, of the West and uh, the California area. In this photograph, you can see uh, you can see Mrs. Poppy standing there. Above her, hanging down from the ceiling, is a framed sign with two horses and the words Levi Strauss and Company, reminding customers that they could buy their Levi's uh, at her shop. Because of the San Francisco earthquake and fire, uh, very little early documentation uh, still exists uh, that tells us the story of the company. Um, this is the headquarters that you saw in picture just a couple of slides ago uh, after the 06 earthquake and fire. And uh, the headquarters was not only destroyed, but most of the company products from, from that time period. But one of the pieces that uh, remained, thanks to an employee who was farsighted and placed it inside a... Um, a fireproof safe is this minute book that you can see on the right hand side. It dates to 1890, just a year before Levi penned that letter. And inside is handwritten notes from uh, 1890 um, that, that describe the company's incorporation. It was in this year that uh, the company became much more professional. I'm sure it was an anticipation of Levi um, letting the company uh, move to his, his four nephews who would eventually take over. Uh, he passed away in 1903, so he was getting older. And as you can see in the, those handwritten notes, uh, that is also the year not only that the company incorporated, but that it gave, it assigned its lot number to its products. And when the number, uh, the lot number 501 for our famous Levi's was first used. 
Another document to survive the 1906 earthquake and fire was this patent. And that's because it's a US patent and it was housed in uh, Washington DC for many years. Uh, it dates to May 20th, 1873, the date that we refer to affectionately as the birthday of blue jeans, because it was on this date that Levi Strauss and company and one of their customers, a tailor from Reno, Nevada named Jacob Davis, um, took out a patent for riveting pants. And that was a tiny innovation, a tiny but important innovation that uh, all came down to, uh, to this, taking a tiny piece of metal, in this case, copper, and adding it to the uh, pocket areas of a pair of pants. Uh, and if you go and look, I go back here on the slide and look at that patent, all the little dots around the pocket area and the base of the button fly, that was the low, those are the locations of the original rivets that give uh, that denim pant its uh, distinctive blue jeans character. Uh, the oldest pair of Levi's that we had on display at the exhibition also dates to the same uh, general time period. These are from 1890 and a pair of Levi's that were found in a Northern California uh, farm. We call them barnyard and you can still see some of the stains and uh, the wear on, on these pants at the front. Uh, you can see the buttons on the, the waistband. Those were for uh, suspenders. Uh, we called these uh, back in, in, in the day, up until the 1960s, overalls. And that's how Levi Strauss and company advertised them because initially they were an overall that you could pull up over your long pants or underwear. They were intended to be a protective overgarment. Uh, and they were different from the bib type garment that came up uh, on the top side. So we call them waist overalls because they sat at your waist. Uh, there are a couple of other distinctive features, especially on the back side. Uh, this back side is, is uh, with its single back pocket, is the easiest way that we can date a 19th century pair of Levi's. We didn't add that second back pocket uh, until 1901 on the right side, and that became the fifth pocket. And if you've heard the term five pocket uh, pant five pocket jean that's where it comes from uh, the, the five pockets uh, two on the back uh, and then on the front side another two larger ones and then a smaller one so if you're wearing a pair of uh, blue jeans today or levi's you'll probably notice a little smaller right uh, pocket on the right side and you may wonder what it was created for originally well here is evidence of what it was used for if you look at the photo the kind of half circle that half uh wear mark circular wear mark on the bottom of that little pocket that was the outline of a pocket watch the original uh, levi's were made with that pocket to accommodate that common accessory of the day, a pocket watch. So we call it a watch pocket. And today uh, we use it, most people put coins or something small in there. Um, there's another pair of Levi's that were on display that has an even better outline or wear mark of that pocket of a pocket watch. And there it is there on this pair of Levi's, the date to the uh, to about the early 1900s. This pair came from a, uh, a mining area in Nevada. And you can see up close some of the, the beautiful uh, distinctive features of the, of the blue jeans, uh, the, the copper rivets and the waist uh, on the waistband, the suspender buttons. Here's how we had the, uh, those Levi's displayed at the exhibition. Uh, the 501s that are laying down there and along with them other artifacts that were that were found in the same area as the Levi's. And that includes a little red tin of Prince Albert tobacco, uh, a plaid shirt, which would have been worn uh, by the miner who wore the Levi's. There's a little piece of bandana near the bottom commonly used by a miner to, to protect their face from dust. And then up at the top right, you'll see a bag or a poke bag as we call it. And that's what they use to, uh, to put their important nuggets, hopefully gold or something else that they would have found um, that they were looking for in a mine. Uh, on the bottom, there's also a little hat with white drippings. Uh, that's not paint. Those are little drips of white 
candle wax, which is uh, what they would have been using in the mine. And then another part, another artifact that's also telling that little piece of newspaper on the leg of the uh, jean, the one with the woman's face illustrated, that's actually a Swedish language newspaper. And uh, it's an indication that the person who wore these Levi's was a Swedish immigrant, and that was pretty common in those early years. Many people coming into California for the gold rush uh, and later were coming from Europe, uh, many who couldn't speak English, and they had their own newspapers like that, Swedish language paper. Uh, the, the men, and they were men in those first years, who were wearing the Levi's were blue collar laborers, everyone from miners and lumberjacks to cowboys, railroad engineers and farmers, anyone who needed tough work pants uh, that could withstand all of the wear that they put to them. And we were so uh, confident, uh, the company was so confident of the strength and durability of their pants uh, that they actually offered a guarantee. And you can see that in this advertisement that dates to 1915. Uh, notice the word overalls that we use here. And at the bottom, uh, you'll notice a guarantee that we gave in those early years, a new pair free if they rip. Uh, and uh, one customer, a very hardworking customer to uh, take us up on that guarantee was the man who wore these Levi's, these well-worn Levi's. Uh, these were purchased by a man named Homer Campbell, who uh, was a hard rock miner in Arizona. He bought his Levi's 501s in 1917, wore them for three years, uh, every day for three years, except Sundays, probably uh, put on his church clothes on Sunday. And as you can see, they've been patched and covered. They've been cuffed and sewn in place. Uh, he had to change out a couple of the buttons on the fly, add a little piece of rope on the top of his fly because the button came off. And uh, he wrote us a letter along with these pants and said they hadn't, he was disappointed they hadn't lasted as long as he expected and could he please get a free pair. By the 1930s, uh, the cowboy became the image and the symbol of the company for uh, marketing products like this one from 1934. The company also began uh, sponsoring rodeo and offering cash prizes to the winning champions in uh, rodeos. Uh, as you can see, this one here, a $2, $200 cash prize. And one of the, uh, the fun pieces that we had on display relates to this award-winning cowboy. His name is Everett Bowman, and he was a master roper. You can see him doing his, his thing wearing Levi's at the Phoenix Rodeo. And uh, Everett ended up becoming a champion, the grand champion of uh, Cowboy in 1937. And his $500 check, which would have been quite an amount back in 1938, uh, was on display in the exhibition. And you can see it here. It's typed out, uh, printed out on the bottom of a guarantee ticket. And a guarantee ticket is what you would see on the back of a 501, on the back right pocket, letting people know that this was a pair of Levi's and they're positively superior to any other competing brand. By the 1930s and into the 40s and 50s, it was colorful advertisements like this one that helped create, uh, in many ways, the myth that people think of when they think about the American West. Uh, this is one of our mural advertisements uh, that we sent out, um, this one dating to the 1950s. And they were created by a, uh, a company called Velvetone that had pioneering uh, methods in creating their advertisements. Uh, they, uh, they were formed in the early 1900s in San Francisco, and they, uh, the night of the opening of the exhibition, we had the grandson of the founder of Velvetone Company with us, and I interviewed him and ex he explained the process of how they created these colorful murals. Uh, it was the first time screen printing, a company had done screen printing, and they would take long, uh, they had giant tables, and they would take long rolls of paper, six feet in length, and then they would silk screen a single color onto the paper, 
then they would do it again with the other colors until they created this vibrant mural. And then that paper would be glued to corrugated cardboard and then rolled up and shipped all over the American West uh, at stores uh, to stores where Levi's were sold, uh, becoming a very popular feature to advertise our overalls. And into the nine, uh, the 1930s, uh, Levi's, of course, uh, the cowboy was an important, remained an important feature uh, of, of our advertising, even uh, an important feature of the World's Fair in 1939, which is what this is a photo of. And it was during the World's Fair that we had the world's uh, first mechanical rodeo. And what that meant is that we had tiny wooden puppets each puppet was hand carved to look like a particular rodeo star, just like the the uh, the cowboy down there at the bottom. And and then the uh, little puppet was outfitted with a pair of, of miniature Levi's, and then it would sit on the top of a Bronco that was electrified, and then it would move, and the the puppet would would sit on there, and it would look like they were at a rodeo. Uh, the World's Fair in 1939 was built on Treasure Island. And in fact, if you've ever been to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, and crossed the Bay Bridge, uh, you'll go right across, right past Treasure Island. This is what it looked like back in 39. Uh, Treasure Island was actually built for the World's Fair. It was to celebrate the opening of the Bay Bridge uh, and the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, which had opened just a few years prior. And uh, one of the great attractions was that fun Levi's Puppet Rodeo. Here's uh, a look, a color picture of it with a little puppet sitting on the back of a Bronco. Uh, one of the, the fun discoveries that we made in putting together the exhibition was um, a box at the top of a shelf in our archives. It was unmarked. And when we opened, up, opened it up, we found one of the last remaining puppets from the Puppet Rodeo uh, on that was in storage. And here's a look at that. Uh, we had it on display at the exhibition. Uh, there's that hand carved puppet uh, with a little pair of Levi's. Um, and you can see the wiring that connected to the, the, bron uh, the little Bronco. Uh, and that show, uh, very popular. And then it toured in a bus across the West, um, helping to buy war bonds during World War II. A year before the World's Fair in 1939, uh, Time Magazine had an article and their cover feature um, showed, illustrated Albert Einstein, who had just immigrated to America. He, uh, it, World War II was, uh, was imminent and he, uh, like many famous scientists left uh, because of his Jewish background, uh, left Germany. He came to America and in the process of becoming a naturalized American citizen, purchased a Levi Strauss leather jacket. That's the jacket that you can see there in the picture. Uh, and he was featured wearing it on the cover of Time magazine in 1938. Uh, he wore the jacket so frequently, he said it was the only coat he ever needed, that he was uh, pictured wearing it in a number of photographs from that era. And we think it's a very appropriate jacket for him to have purchased um, the jacket of an iconic American company as he was becoming an official American citizen. And this, by the way, is the photo that I snapped at Christie's Auction House in 2016 in London when I made the winning bid on the jacket. And you can get a look at, uh, at the price that we, uh, that we paid. Was, we're very excited to get the jacket. And it was one of the, uh, the gems of the exhibition uh, at the museum. Uh, fast forward to the 1940s, World War II, uh, San Francisco became the uh, disembarkation point for many GIs who were heading to the Pacific Theater. Uh, GIs like this, um, this man, one of the few African American, um, one of the few African Americans to serve overseas uh, during World War II. And uh, when he came back from, from the war, he ended up relocating in, San in the San Francisco Bay Area. He bought himself a Harley motorcycle and some Levi's. 
and uh, joined the first um, African-American motorcycle club in the country. They were called the Berkeley Tigers. And I got to meet and interview Leo Hopkins, um, who is now in his 90s. And he still had some footage of that era when he was a part of the, uh, the bike club. Uh, here it is. It was also on display at the exhibition. And you can see those Levi's uh, cuffed that are being worn by, uh, by the guys who uh, would get together they did precision drills and tricks on their bikes. Not easy to do. Those Harleys are super heavy. And uh, you can also see them not only uh, practicing their drills on the road, but on the weekends, they would go out with their girlfriends. Uh, and you can see some of the pictures of, of that in that footage. It wasn't until the 1960s that uh, Levi Strauss and company started calling blue jeans uh, jeans. It was overalls up until this uh, up until that time. And as you can see at the bottom of this advertisement, take a look underneath the word Levi's America's finest jeans. This is a 1967 advertisement for the new 505 zippered jean. And it was also a switch to using the word jeans for the first time. Why was that? Um, that's because in the 60s and the late 60s, especially during the era of the rising youth culture, many young people were wearing and adopting blue jeans and they call them jeans and we wanted to stay relevant. So we changed the name. Uh, wearing blue jeans was not only popular, but it, uh, they became a canvas for many young people who would transform their jeans, in this case, white jeans uh, that we sold, not only blue, and they would patch them up, paint them, embroider, and create artwork out of them. Uh, it was so popular that we, uh, that the company actually sponsored a denim, a Levi's denim art contest. And we invited people to decorate their Levi's and then send in slides of their entries and the winning entries would be selected to tour the United States at museums around the country. And this is one of the winning entries. It was, uh, it's a pair of white Levi's that were uh, customized by Doug, D-U-G. You can see his name embroidered on the bottom uh, left of that uh, pair of, of Levi's. And there's Doug with his Volkswagen bug appropriately. He's from Val, uh, Valdosta, Georgia and uh, one of the winners. Uh, another winner of the Levi's Denim Art Contest from 1973 was this woman here from, uh, from Connecticut. Uh, she, uh, her name was Eva Orsini, and uh, she created this pair of clown pants, um, and she wanted to make a political statement. Uh, these are called the Watergate jeans, and she depicted uh, the Watergate scandal that brought down the Nixon presidency uh, during those years. And she was the fourth place winner of the Levi's Denim Art Contest from uh, Connecticut. In contrast to some of those vibrant uh, and uh, very happy looking pairs of Levi's, this uh, is a pair of Levi's that was customized. They were owned by a former prison inmate. He, um, he bought them in 1979 when he was incarcerated. And over the course of his 30 year incarceration, he illustrated every inch of those genes. And uh, here's what they look like on display at the exhibit, uh, the front side. You can get a look at some of the dark uh, images that are there. We get a look at the, uh, in many ways, at the uh, American penal system, uh, penitentiary system, uh, taking a look at these Levi's. Um, he was released in 2013, and uh, we acquired these in uh, a couple of years after that for the archives. By the mid-1970s, uh, jeans and Levi's in particular were so popular that they were being worn by most everyone, adults, young people alike. But there was one group of people that, uh, that wasn't wearing them, and that was because they were difficult to do uh, if you happen to be disabled. And in 1975, uh, Levi's introduced uh, what we called functional jeans that were just as stylish, but offered some practical additions to make them uh, usable. Um, this is my colleague, Danny, who, uh, who you can see behind the scenes at the museum uh, dressing this mannequin. 
the Levi's jeans, these functional jeans had zips at the top and the bottom on both sides, making them easy to get in and out of. There was also a belt around the top. So if someone needed to go uh, to use the restroom, the uh, jeans would stay in place. And uh, here they are on display. They were a remarkable way for, uh, for people, even those with disabilities to fit in and be stylish in Levi's. Uh, by uh, during the 1980s, uh, this was uh, a time to celebrate in the United States uh, during the time of the Olympics and at Levi Strauss and Company, because we were named the official outfitter of the Olympic Games in 1980 and again in 1984. Uh, on the left is a picture of the, uh, the outfits that were created for the athletes excuse me, at the Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics at Lake Placid, New York. And uh, we had on display that, um, that suit that was made, that blue suit, velour suit was made for the athletes. Um, and though that uh, suit was made for Rosalind Carter uh, and their uh, a piece from the Jimmy Carter Presidential uh, Library. And you may remember that uh, the Moscow Olympics uh, Athletes, U.S. athletes did not attend because uh, Carter boycotted those Olymp Olympics. And instead of going, instead of the athletes heading over to, to Moscow, instead they met at the White House with uh, Rosalind and Jimmy Carter and uh, had a special dinner with them. Uh, for many people, the, uh, the era of the 1980s was also a time of sadness, and in particular for the gay community in San Francisco, many of whom were employees or friends of employees, um, and that's uh, because of the epidemic that uh, broke out in the um, that was discovered in the 80s. Uh, in the beginning, there was no name for it um, and was later identified as AIDS, uh, HIV, and uh, this is one of the panels created by employees, the bottom right panel there, uh, employees for the original AIDS quilt in 1988. Uh, you won't know it by looking at it, but that giant pocket that you see uh, down at the bottom, on the back side are uh, sewn in uh, letters written to employees and friends of employees who died of, uh, of the epidemic, died of the disease. One of the pieces on display. Another and a more recent piece, uh, the biggest piece on display at the exhibition was this giant denim American flag. It was created by designers at Levi Strauss after September 11th, and each of the stars that uh, were uh, added to the flag was made individually by a designer, so they're all unique, and it is um, by far the largest piece that uh, was on display. You can see it next to our 1973 Levi's branded Gremlin um, on display there. And then at the bottom left, the uh, video screen where Leo Hopkins uh, biking videos were, were on display. It took quite a number of people to put the exhibition together. And this is, uh, these are photographs of some of the scenes uh, that we, uh, all the work that we had to go into to, to putting it on display from measuring to uh, selecting pieces, uh, even to moving that gremlin into place. Uh, the exhibition was, uh, the main part of the exhibition was on the third floor of the museum and we barely got the gremlin onto the um, the elevator. There was like two inches of space on either side. And so we're celebrating once, once we got it into, um, into its spot. But the, uh, despite the closure after the COVID pandemic um, in, in February, in March, 2020, uh, the, uh, there was a lot of, we had a month long where we had lots of visitors, we had a lot of media, and then we reopened it later. And what I want to finish with is a couple of stories related to um, the successes um, from hearing from people about the exhibition. And the first one relates to the Einstein jacket that we had on display. Uh, here it is in the case, um, just the way that Einstein, uh, Albert would have worn it, buttoned all the way up to the top. Uh, it, uh, one of the unique features of this jacket is that it has a scent. Einstein was known to smoke a pipe and uh, 
when um and the jacket still has the the scent of pipe smoke on it uh and we i was interviewed for a couple of um of magazine articles and newspapers including this article in gq in gq that talked about the jacket uh, being on display and a number of people read the article and uh, read about the jacket not only being on display but it having this unusual scent and one of the people uh who read about the scent and got in touch with us was the man here on the left. His name is Matthew Smith, and he is a member of the Klamath Modoc tribe. Uh, those are native tribes in um, Oregon and Washington in the north uh, west of uh, the United States. He's standing with his dad, uh, Al, there on the right, and uh, Al is wearing an unusual Levi's jacket. It's a special custom jacket that Matthew made for his dad. And the reason that Matthew reached out to us is because when he read about the Einstein jacket, it reminded him of the jacket he'd made for his dad, which also has an unusual scent, but it's not pipe smoke. It has the scent of the hide, the deer and the elk hide that he used uh, to uh, customize the jacket. There's the backside with both of those hides added to it. You can also see the Pendleton blanket insert that he added. Uh, I interviewed Matthew and he shared these pictures with me. Beautiful additions, uh, including the beadwork on those pocket flaps at the front. Uh, Matthew's sister is a master at beading, and she did the work there. And because of his reaching out, uh, we started a correspondence. And uh, when the exhibition reopened, uh, we added that jacket to the uh, to the display. Uh, by the way, this is Al uh, Matthew's dad, Al, who uh, owned and wore the jacket. Um, Al became famous for the. Um, court case that he took to the Supreme Court. Um, Al, I should say, um, has always been a fan of Levi's and he wore them when he argued his freedom of religion case at uh, the Supreme Court in Washington, DC. It was a case about his use of peyote in, ritual, uh, in rituals. And although uh, he lost the case, uh, he paved the way for um, practices uh, that we, uh, that many, Native Americans enjoy today. Um, and here's a look at the jacket uh, once we put it on display uh, when it reopened in April 2022 um, with its fun history. Something that we wouldn't have been able to do without having the exhibition and without having the closure um, because of COVID. Uh, here's another uh, story that we learned about um, from the exhibition being opened. It's a story about the, the boy in the middle. His name is Eric Gatman, and this picture is from 1933. Uh, it's from Stuttgart, uh, Germany. At the time, Eric was a young boy, and uh, when Eric read, Eric and his family read about the exhibition in a newspaper. Uh, Eric's now in his 90s. He lives north of San Francisco, and his daughter got in touch with me, and she emailed me, and the subject line of her email uh, read, Levi's saved my family from the Nazis. And of course, with that uh, subject line, I had to reach out to her, which I which I did. And the story was that in 33, when uh, the Nazi Socialist Party came to power, um, Eric Gatman's family, they're uh, being Jewish, knew that there was no place for them uh, in Germany. They left. And the only reason they were able to leave is because their uncle, who had been living in California and made his um, made his fortune selling Levi's, um, granted the um, his savings to their family and they used it to move uh, to California. Okay, last story before I wrap it up here. And this is a story about uh, the photo that you see on the screen. It was a photo we had as part of the exhibition. Uh, this was taken in 1944 during World War II when there were lots of shortages uh, because of the war effort. And uh, among the items that were uh, hard to come by were Levi's. And you can see this picture. Levi's today are being advertised in the window of this men's and boys wear store. And the line is queuing out on the street in order to get in and buy their Levi's. So this, uh, this a terrific picture a photograph was on display at the exhibition. And in that month that the exhibit was open, um, a man named Mike Levy, 
came in with his wife and two daughters. He saw this photograph and recognized it immediately as his dad's store. Um, his dad's name was Sam, Le uh, Sam Levy, uh, but he shortened it for the store and called it Lee's. It's a store in Berkeley, California, across the bay from San Francisco, where I went to school. And uh, Mike was so delighted to see this picture. He explained uh, that the, uh, the young boys photographed near the back of the line were his middle school uh, playmates uh, from school, his classmates. And uh, it was fun to interview him and learn about uh, his story. All of the things, um, some of the, the terrific stories that we learned after having that exhibition. So uh, that's it for me. I've left my uh, email on the screen and I would invite any of you who wanna get in touch, who have questions to email me, or if you have Levi's um, that have been in your family or in the closet or attic somewhere, I wanna know about them, so reach out. And uh, with that, I am going to uh, stop sharing and turn it back over to Anthony and happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Tracy, that was amazing. Um, what I really love is that Levi's as a company really cares about its history. Um, now, what was the selection process like for selecting those exhibition pieces? I'm sure you had tens of thousands of items to pick from. Um, we did. <laughs> we had lots of things. We came up with uh, with with uh, four basic themes to kind of cover the um, the span of the company. Uh, uh, we came up with with a section that focused on Levi himself and his upbringing in Germany. Uh, another section devoted to the gold rush and um, Levi's San Francisco when he arrived. Um, two final sections were about um, the, the American West and the imagery and the, uh, the creation of Levi's as this um, image in the West. And then the final part uh, related to pop culture, pop and counterculture. So everything from hippie jeans to uh, jeans worn by uh, Madonna during her 1990s uh, girly show tour were, were on display. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, somebody asked, did you ever call Levi's dungarees? Uh, it's interesting that you should ask. Uh, dungarees, uh, were, we never call them at the company uh, dungarees. Uh, what I've come to find out is, is that it's much more of an East Coast term. Um, in the West, overalls were, were what we used. Uh, but when uh, we've had letters from uh, customers on the East Coast, and they would refer to them as dungarees. So I think that's more um, East Coast term referring to a work plant, a work pant. Yeah, good question. Um, somebody also asks, when did competing companies start? Yeah. So uh, remember the patent from 1873 that I shared early on. Uh, most patents in the United States uh, last about 20 years. And after that, they go into the public and anybody can, uh, can use the innovation that's created from the patent. And that's what happened in the case of uh, Levi's rivets. 1873, the patent was taken out. By 1890-ish, when it expired, anybody could do the same thing. And that's when some of the first competitors came out. Um, although there were a number who tried to compete and try to rivet pants before the patent expired. And we, um, we took them to court. And the litigation that came out of that um, is some of the best testimony that we have of how the product was created because uh, Levi had to testify. Jacob Davis, the tailor that uh, was on that, that patent um, came to testify. But short answer, uh, Anthony, is uh, by 1890, the first competitors uh, creating their own riveted jeans um, were on the market. Thank you. Um, someone also asks, do descendants of the Levi family run the company today? Uh, yes. So you saw a picture, um, you saw a photograph of uh, Bob Haas, who was the great, great grand nephew. He attended the opening. Uh, he was a former CEO who retired. Um, the current CEO is not a member of the family, but the, the family still has uh, an important part on the board. They are located in the San Francisco Bay Area and are very involved in uh, the company and especially uh, treasure the company's history, which is um, one of the reasons why I get to work here. Uh, Bob Haas, uh, that descendant of Levi, is the one who hired the first historian who set up the archives of the company. 
Thank you. Um, somebody writes, I saw the exhibit during the one month that it was open. Does the headquarters Yay. have does the headquarters have a history display now and where is it located? Yeah, we do. We have a small museum. It's called the Vault. And if you come to Levi's Plaza, uh, you will see it. However, during this this uh, strange uh, COVID period, the um, headquarters is not open to the public. Uh, we only reopened. Um, we reopened, closed, reopened to employees. Uh, so at the moment, it's not, uh, you, you can't come until uh, we open generally. There's also a store in our headquarters. So as soon as the store opens, the museum will reopen. And by the way, we're located just across um, from the San Francisco cruise ship terminal. So if you want to come visit us, you can fly and come to SFO, our airport, or you could take a cruise ship and then walk across the street and come to visit us at Levi's headquarters. That's wonderful. Um, are the archives open um, to the public? Um, are they allowed to visit? Um... Uh, no, uh, short answer. You can come to the museum. Uh, you can come by uh, by special arrangement or appointment, but that uh, there has to be a particular need. Uh, for instance, uh, we work with other museums and we host their curators. If we have professional researchers, uh, we let them come in and uh, take a look. But the archives, and you can see um, you can see the archives behind me. That blue wall is a painted blue because uh, next next to the the cabinets is a blue fireproof safe where we keep the oldest blue jeans in the world and. Other, other items. Uh, so uh, we do share out the material, but the archives itself is really for our designers to come and get inspiration and to be used for uh, uh, for employees to to do research. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, somebody asks, where did the original fabric come from? Yeah, good question. Where the denim come from, right? Um, I will say that uh, Levi Strauss and Company did not create denim. Uh, denim has been a long time workwear fabric. Um, the name comes from, uh, and the name has been used historically um, um, much earlier than uh, than in the 19th century when we started using it at the company. Um, people will will uh, may know the name Serge Denim in France. So that name was out there in Genoa in Italy, uh, where the name Jean so, uh, comes from as well. Those are historic terms, but they're not related to the denim that the company used. Um, in 1873, when the company started manufacturing, uh, we uh, selected denim from the Amiskag mill in New Hampshire. And uh, in those early years, it had to be shipped to us before the, um, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, well, yeah, by then it would have been completed, um, would have come to us. But the, the denim was American made, 100% cotton. And then eventually we moved to uh, the cone mills, which was in uh, North Carolina. But good question, yeah. Oh, thank you, all right, we have two more questions. Um, so the, um, this question is, how many people does the Levi's company employ? Well, uh, several, several thousand. I don't know what the exact number is. And uh, during COVID, we actually uh, had to, uh, we, we tightened things and we lost a number of people. Um, so uh, in the United States, I would say that there's uh, several thousand uh, and most of our, the factories where they're produced now are outsourced. So they're not employed. Uh, they're not Levi Strauss employees like they used to be. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, don't know the exact number, uh, but the, we've got headquarters in San Francisco where I am. That's where most of the employees are. And we also have headquarters in Europe, in Brussels and in Asia. And the, the uh, Asia headquarters is out of Singapore where several hundred employees are, are, are there as well. Oh, thank you. All right. So our last question is, did Homer get his free pair of jeans and did those last him longer than the original three years? <laughs> Good, good question. And I don't know the answer. He would have gotten his jeans, I believe so. Uh, but I don't know how long they lasted. It's such a funny story because he, uh, you know, you look at those and you think, boy, he got his, he got his money worth out of them. But uh, we stood behind the, the guarantee. And 
the, the pants have been on display. Homer's pants, since they were returned to us in 1920, have been all over the world. They've been to Disneyland. When Disneyland opened up, they were on display there. Then I took them to Germany several years ago where they were on display at um, the company's history museum, uh, Federal National History Museum in Bonn. And uh, they were again on display uh, for this exhibition. So uh, they've gotten a lot of, a lot of world travel. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, we're getting a lot of comments about um, that it was just a, a great presentation um, and you. that they're, they're thanking you. Um, Tracy, this was such a great pleasure. Thank you for being with us. Um, it was just, it was really wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Take um, care, everyone. Thank you. Uh, New Canaan community, thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening um, and thank you. And thank you again, Tracy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.